small groups in church. Okay, let's go ahead now. Let's get into the new, uh, the new passage for tonight. Let's turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11, uh, 11 to 22. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. Let's go ahead and read the Word of God, and let's get into our discussion tonight. The Word of the Lord. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcised by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth, the citizenship of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope, without God in the world, but now in Christ. Jesus, you who were formerly far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing it in his flesh, the enmity, which the Lord, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross. By it, having put to death enmity, he came and preached, peace to those who are far away, peace to those who are near, for through him we have both, we both have one access through one spirit to the Father. So you are no longer strangers or aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fit together is growing into a holy temple to the Lord, in whom you also are built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, as we study this word, open our eyes. Give us understanding to see and to grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's go ahead. Let's look at this passage. I'm just going to start making observations and feel free to interrupt. Maybe I'll ask a question. Let's look first at, at uh, verse 11. And so just highlighting quickly here, therefore, remember. And so this is, a, this is a command. Just as in chapter two, he was calling them to think about who, who they were in relationship to God prior, right? They are dead in sins. They're dead in transgressions following Satan. That's dealing fundamentally with their relationship with God. Now, He's going to, to look at a different relationship, okay? And so the command is to go back to your former life and to remember. And so the, the first, if I'm preaching this, just looking exegetically here, there is this, this command here. So maybe this is my first major point looking down the line. So there's this command. We'll come back to that word later, okay? We'll, we'll discuss that word later, okay? Um, but at least for right now, we have the first major point. Remember. So what is it that they need to remember? So there are several things that they need to remember. Number one, so the content of memory, number one, is that they were what? Outsiders. Gentiles. Yes. Gentiles. So number one, they are... The first thing is that they are Gentiles. And so looking at this word Gentiles, we can, we can immediately identify that this is a, an issue um, of relationship between groups of people. So whereas 2, 1 to 10 dealt with their relationship with God, now, they're, now Paul is looking at what has God done in, in making the new man, relationships between man. Okay, is that making, is that making sense? So now the topic, this is perhaps a, 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 new, a new topic, okay, concerning what God has done in bringing man, humanity together. I'm sorry, excuse. Yeah, go ahead. Did you say that uh, Paul here is referring to the Gentiles per se or the uh, Gentiles uh, believer? So this is, this is a time reference. So we, what we want to say is, so specifically, let us just highlight things. Maybe this will come to sense. So specifically, there is a U there. The U is specifically Gentile Ephesians, right? 
Ephesian saints. That who the, that is very specific who the you is. But at the time, this is um, before before Christ. So he so he's dealing with Gentiles before they became believers. They're called Gentiles in the flesh. Who is this specifically? So let's just add a clarification here. They are uncircumcised, right? So it's a pejorative term, right? And it's by the so-called circumcision. And these people, this is their description. But notice here, it's, it's, it's done by, uh, this is the means and it's physical. Think about this for a second. If there is a circumcision by hands, what would be an implication of this? If there is a circumcision by hands, what else might there be? By, by works, the human oh. work, human effort. Oh. Yeah, so this is, so this is, so that, let's be clear here. So this is physical circumcision. There will be spiritual circumcision also. So. Ah, spiritual circumcision. Excellent. So does everyone see the implication that's going on here? If there's a physical circumcision, there must also be a spiritual circumcision. Okay. And so let's just go very briefly to, to a passage of scripture and let's look at these references to, in Paul's concept, he is definitely looking at um, contrasting physical and spiritual, okay, physical and spiritual. So, all right, so turning your Bibles first to Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, when we load here, verses uh, 25 and following. For circumcision indeed is a value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded or considered as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. Look at this. For one is a Jew who is for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward or physical. So look at that wordplay that Paul's playing off in Ephesians 2. The ones being called uncircumcision by the ones who are called circumcision in the flesh. <laughs> but, verse 29, a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. And so, what we're looking at here is that God doesn't care about physical ethnicity. What matters is this circumcision of the heart, not physical circumcision. Let's go to another passage here. Colossians 2. Colossians 2. So you should maybe, maybe take notes of these passages. These are parallel. Okay? Colossians 2, verse 11. Verse 9. For in him, for in Christ, the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Made without hands. By the putting off of the body of the flesh. By the circumcision of Christ. And just to be crystal clear. I don't want to be confusing here. Christ is, it, it muddies the water here. This is by the circumcision ups, the circumcision of Messiah. So think about in this session tonight, I want us to be thinking about our relationship with the Old Testament, the promises to Israel, the people of God in the Old Testament. Think about the Messiah was the promise of Israel. Correct? And so now this circumcision, physical circumcision doesn't matter. What matters actually is the spiritual circumcision of Christ. So let's come back here. And so what I'm trying to get at here is that no man can break down this. This is, this is, let's just, let's just put it here. This is, this here is creating hostility. 
No one can break this down, right? Because you're, you're having one group saying you're uncircumcised. We're circumcised. There's no way that you can be in us unless we have the true circumcision of the Messiah. Is everyone tracking? So the issue is, is that this can be undone, and he's going to show that. It, it can be undone through the Messiah, and we have parallel passages to this. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that this is not another plan. We're not going into uh, this, this, other, this other plan of God. This is dealing with promise and fulfillment, and it's in a Jewish-Gentile hostility and reconciliation. Number one, remember that you, you have this hostility. You're called Gentiles in the flesh. You don't have the circumcision, so you're not, you're not in the plan of God, right? You have, this, you have this enmity between Jew and Gentile, okay? And then look at the second content that they have to be reminded of. So content number two. At that time, what did this mean? If they were Gentiles in the flesh and uncircumcised, what did that mean for them? Let's list this out here. Number one, they were separated from Messiah. Number two, they were excluded outside. Outside, and so this is literal, okay? Citizenship. This word is very literal here. Citizenship. Outside the citizenship of Israel. Number three. Strangers to the covenants of promise. What are the covenants of promise? Let, let's be specific here. From biblical theology, those who took biblical theology, what are the covenants of promise? Redemption. Okay, yes, redemption. But I'm thinking specifically of covenants. Become the family uh, member of, of God's kingdom. Yeah, okay. So the Abrahamic, the Abrahamic covenant, right? Number two, the Davidic covenant. That's concerning the, 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 the kingdom, right? And then number three, new covenant. So we have three covenants here. And then all of these are, are, are reaching back to the promise, the promise to Eve of the new Adam, the new coming Adam. And that's being realized, that new, that new Adam that's being realized through the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the new covenants, this is, this new Adam is Messiah. Okay, so we're being very specific here, okay? So they, number one, you're at enmity with the Jews, with Israel, the, the, the circumcision of the flesh. But, but it's not ultimate, right? Because of the circumcision of the heart, that can be changed because it doesn't matter about our, our physical ethnic background. What matters is the heart. That's what I was trying to really emphasize back there. Okay, number four, number four, having no hope. And number five, without God in the world. And so what we want to stress here is that we, we think of this in a, in a universal um, in a universal like sense that God can, 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 have, can, can reveal himself to 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 the tribes and all these different people. Okay, but, but in the Old Testament, the way that you had a relationship with God was only through Israel. It's only through the covenants of promise. It's only through the Old, the, 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 the Old Testament law. And so to not be a part of Israel is to, be, is to have no hope without God. Is everyone tracking there with me? So if this is the problem, the solution has to answer these problems. Is everyone tracking there with me? The solution must have in its solution the fixing of these problems. Perhaps that draws a much closer relationship of us as the church with the Old Testament promises, with the Old Testament people of God, with Israel itself. Is everyone tracking there with me? I really want us to draw to see the heavy, heavy continuity promise fulfillment relationship. Okay, let's move on here. This is a command, and this is the this is the past, past reality. So if I'm preaching this, that's like my first major point, and I got all these sub points to talk about to discuss. Look at this verse thirteen. But now, it's a time reference. 
the circumcision of the heart, the circumcision of Christ. Look at this. In, in Messiah. In Messiah, you who were description. Description. You who were a formerly afar off. So this is the description here, right? So this is far off, brought near language, okay? You have been brought location action instrument you have been brought near by the blood of christ this refers back to the the old t sacrifices right so that's old testament references where were they afar off from from, from god just god Covenants of promise, right? They were far from that. I'm trying to help us to see that you can't, you can't, if you say you're far from God, you're far from the promises as well. If you're close to God, you're close to the promises from, from the people of God. And this is Israel. So now they are brought near. And what people will say, oh, you're, you're near, but you're not in. But the whole point is that when you are when you bring the sacrifice near, when you come into the presence of the king, you when you come near, you are now in. This this idea is of relationship, or we can say inclusion. So if you said in this passage you were formerly Gentile, circumcision size of the flesh, afar off. Now you brought near, you have to look at it in these. This context, does everyone see that? Now, God is going to create something new. But what I want to emphasize here is that, number one, there's no, there's no, there is not, let me write this down. I'm going to highlight this so that you, you can really see this. There are not two plans of God. There's one plan. God is bringing together. And, and how can we be sure of this? What was the Abrahamic, pro what was the Abrahamic covenant promise? Anyone, you'll what be, was the promise? To, you'll be blessing to all nations. So in the original, it was always, the whole point was that this, because this was going to originally undo this. This was the fulfillment. So Israel was to fulfill the problem of the curse and the fall. Does everyone see that? So we can't talk about in big type pictures, we can't talk about the church having nothing to do with Israel. It's all just Israel's on the side. God's Paul is the plan of God, or or Israel is just a physical type, and there's this new thing that has no connection. You, you, uh, you the two are intertwined because of God the covenants of promise. Abraham, David, new covenants. These are all covenants to Israel. So we can't say that Israel is just a type, and now we have this new church. All Israel was just a, a physical picture. That's it. No, th there's this organic relationship. We talked about that in biblical theology, where we are the fulfillment. We are part of Israel. Not that we're in the old, the old, the same old system of the sacrificial system, the the old covenant in its entirety. But if you can imagine, it's it's like it's like the kingdom of England, right? The kingdom of, of England, let's just do a parallel here. We'll take a break. The kingdom of England, let me, let's just give an example here. Kingdom of England, right? They had a monarchy, right? Then you had the Magna Carta, and this led to parliament, right? There's, there's a parliament. And essentially, the parliament and, and king still had a lot of authority, right? And then now, pretty much... The, the parliament, I'm probably misspelling this. Please forgive me if you are English. Really, this was like, this was the, the ruler. Then they, they both ruled. And so now the, the king is just, actually, it's the queen, right? <laughs> the queen. It's the, well, it's, it's the, 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 the king, queen. But now all the power is in the parliament, right? So you would never say, you would never say that, oh, when they develop the parliament, it's a new, it's a new, it's a new plan. Like 
the kingdom of England is gone, right? You would never say that. You would just say there's been a transition in the structure, okay? And so coming back here, what we're going to be discussing is that for sure there's this, there's this new temple of God. We're going to see this on the second break. There's a new temple of God. There's a new, there's a new building. But, but we would never say that, we would never say that um, you have Israel and all Israel, Israel is done away with. And there's this new church. And all this is, is a type. We would never, that's, that's incorrect. What we would want to say is something like this. You have Israel. You have Israel. You have the, the fathers. You have the, 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 the Mosaic law. And then you have the new covenant. Of course, there's been a transition. But you would never say that, oh, it's, and so within the new covenant, of course, is, is the church. Do you see how this is, this is wrong? And then the other people, they would just say this, Israel and the church. So if, if you're looking at, if you're looking at big ideas, okay, this would be more dispensational. There's many views with New Covenant, and I, I, I'm not here to critique this, and, and I have a lot of good friends. You know, Sonny is, is New Covenant. I have close friends in the U.S. that are New Covenant. But I would say that this is more New Covenant, and maybe if, if that's not your view, you, you can correct me, but that's how I've understood at least there's different views. Um, and then this, is, this would be traditional covenant uh, theology. Okay, and so we are getting a little bit into, into to, to issues here. So these are, these are three views on the relationship here. And so looking here, explicitly, you are far off and brought near. Brought near to what? Israel, the promises, we have hope now, we have God, we have Messiah, okay? And so looking at this relationship, which one fits better here? The covenant. It, it has to be. This is something, this is not gospel, okay? So if you don't accept this, it's not going to affect your salvation. We're not going to separate or anything, but this does matter. If we are the direct fulfillment to Old Testament prophecies, that is phenomenal. Massive assurance. If all we are is just a type, if Israel is just a type pointing to this new reality, there's no organic connection. So we talked about organic connection. There is a solid, undeniable, direct link between, we could say, the seed to the tree or the seed to the flower. It's one, it's, or it, 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 it's not symmetrical, but it's, 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 it's a, a direct promise fulfillment connection. We, we, we have to see this. I think that this is the best, especially from this context. Any questions or comments? Maybe you want to push back. Maybe you want to disagree. Go ahead, Danny, go ahead. Uh, eventually, there will be no more Jew and uh, Gentile uh, believers. It will be one church. Yeah. And, and that, doesn't, that doesn't minimize the diversity, meaning to say that I am still a Gentile, okay? I'm in the church. For sure, we have Jewish friends that are in the church. It's to say that we're all in the same body, and we all have equal value, and we are all equally participating in Christ. That's what's being said, okay? So in the same way that there's still, I'm a man, my wife is a female, but in in the church, we all have the same value. We all experience the same benefit as daughters and brothers, brothers and sisters. And so we should not say, oh, because, because of this, God's not going to save any more Jews. There's no future for the Jews. There is a future for the Jews in Christ, <laughs> in Messiah, in Messiah. And, and, and if you want to look at a parallel, maybe this makes perfect sense. Romans 11 is a perfect parallel here, where you have the the the, the 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 root which is Christ the, the 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 Israelites are cut off the Gentiles are grafted on and then he says 
Israel can be grafted back, right? And so, and so it's, we're not negating the promises for Israel. Israel still, the promises will be fulfilled to Israel in Christ. <laughs> so we're not, yeah. we're not, it's not supersession. It is promise and fulfillment. And what we want to say here, I, I hear you, Sonny, I'll, I'll let you talk in a second. What we want to say here is there's one, there is one organic structure in the history of redemption. Yeah, yeah, certainly in, in terms of, of this, actually, I, I agree with this, uh, your presentation of, of the covenant. That's, that's actually my, my, my incline of belief. Uh, I mean, incline of, of a covenantal framework. Actually, in, in the new covenant perspective, uh, actually, the new covenant perspective had, I think, three views, that they, diverse three views yeah. of this. Uh, you're, yeah, just, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're just presenting the, the one, one view, which is I don't agree. That, yeah. uh, that 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 type one it's that it, it it seems like it seems like if you read it carefully the old testament is it's not really historical account because it never happened in history so that's why i i am um i am still a new covenant theology uh theology inclined to new new covenant theology uh, more inclined of what you are presenting actually is that, that the church yeah. is 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 the continuation of of the israel no, so, yeah. so, you know, I really appreciate that, Sonny, because there are some new covenant guys, like you're saying, and so there's definitely a debate. There is, a, there, like you're saying, there's three views, okay? So I, I do think, and maybe a new covenant would not agree with me, but, but I, what I would say is that if you hold to this middle view, I really don't see the need, the need for being new covenant then, because fundamentally you're covenant and you're just arguing over specific details. Does that make sense, Sonny? Yeah, but, but the big thing that we, want, we should see here is that the big takeaway here is that what Paul is saying is that in this church, we're going to look at this in the second half, the, the last half of the discussion, in the church, it's the new humanity. So we have new covenant. What Paul highlights here is this new humanity, and it's in the context of Israel. The Gentiles were far off. They're brought near with the Jews, and there's this new humanity, this new temple, this new creation that's being done, this new covenant. If this is fulfilling promises in Old Testament concerning reconciliation of Jew and Gentile, massive assurance. Our assurance for the future is based upon God's faithfulness to the past. Our assurance for the future promises future fulfillment is based upon God's faithfulness in the past. And so we're going to see here is that, in fact, promises in Isaiah are fulfilled when, when, when Christ brings together Jew and Gentile. And so this really kind of gets at issues with dispensationalism. This is, not, this is not an aside. The church is not an aside like, oh, Israel is just too hard-headed. I'm going to put Israel aside and let's deal with the church. No, no, no. The church is the fulfillment. We are experiencing the benefits of Messiah now. Doesn't deny earthly promises in the future. Doesn't deny promises that, you know, all the things. But it, what it is saying is that we are not an aside. We are fulfillment. Okay. So we are not an aside. We are fulfillment. Okay. Let's go all right. So let's continue on here. We've already discussed the blood of Christ. I won't go into the details again. Suffice it to say that uh, this, the blood of Christ is describing the propitiation of our sin and, and the wrath of God. And so uh, that's the, that's the, it's a shorthand term for what's being, um, which is being um, canceled. The sin is being canceled and God is being made fa favorable. We can confirm that with the, this, the, the following statement, this, this description here, this description here, for he himself is our peace. And so, Jesus, and this is highlighting, it's highlighting the work of Christ. He is our peace. And so th this only makes sense if the wrath of God is being appeased. And so here we can clearly see, Diba, we talked about before, we talked about that the opposite of peace is, the opposite is, is war and wrath correct 
So if Jesus is our peace, the implication is that he is the one that appeases the wrath of God. So wrath is fundamental to the atonement of Christ. And so I won't make, we've talked about this before. I won't go into detail there. Okay, but, but who is, what, he is our peace, okay? And then the question is, um, obviously you have this idea here of peace and wrath, but, but in this context below, how has he brought peace to, to um, humanity? So, right, we're talking about humanity, not, not between the Father. We're asking, how has he made peace between Jew and Gentile, okay? And so now we have several descriptions here. Number one, number one description, he has made both groups into one, two groups into one. So when, was, when did we have all of these splitting of people groups? Just think about this for a second. Where was the splitting of groups? Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel, right? Tower of Babel. They were split. And then now humanity is being reunited. Or we could say reconciled together. So even going back to the big structures, if, if both groups, so this is, this is Jew and Gentile are now one. Do you understand how kind of the, you know, I don't want to keep knocking on these different th theological structures, but dispensationalism says that we have this one group and then he's going to go back and, and, and we're going to bring back the sacrifices. We're going to bring back the nation of Israel and all the different physical things. And it, it's almost like we're going backwards in this grand scheme of biblical theology, right? If, 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 if the Tower of Babel is being reconciled here, Gentiles and Jews are being brought into one, we would not want to go back to an era where there's a division again, Iba, correct? And so here, number one, he's made two groups into one. Number two, he's done this by breaking down barriers. So he's made two groups one, and he's removed the obstacles. So it, in making two, you could make two groups one, and then they'd split again, right? They'd split when they fight, okay? But he's removed obstacles to cause division. And look at this. How has he done this? The means, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity. Where does this enmity come from? The law Genesis, of Genesis, Genesis. Uh, well, yeah, so originally, yeah. So there would be enmity there in Genesis, but for sure. So, so there's types, there's types for sure. The but, mosaic, mosaic law. But specifically in this context, uh, boy, it's, it's the, this is the description, right? This is, it's the, the mosaic law. But, but not all of the law, right? So I'm gonna, we're gonna look at this in a second here. Um, it's specifically those commandments contained in ordinances, okay? Or we could say regulations, right? So think about this for a second, okay? The, the, this word is very strong, okay? The word here, abolish, is very strong, strong, okay? So the issue right now, this comes back to biblical theology and also we are discussing with Matthew, we are discussing with Matthew 5, 17, right? Matthew 5, 17 to 20, okay? And Jesus says, I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Oh my goodness. Here he says he abolished. <laughs> Is there a contradiction? <laughs> Does everyone see that? Number one, the way we answer this, number one, is that it's, this is not ultimate, but concerning perspective. Looking at the Jew-Gentile relationship, there is part of the law that has been done away with. From a Gentile perspective, a Gentile would say that he's abolished. A Jew would say he's fulfilled. Does that make sense? So I'll throw a, a, a small nugget to, to discussion on, if you've never heard of a new perspective, don't waste your time. But this is, one, this is one aspect that they highlight 
It's also in other reformed um, teachings, so it's not original to new perspective, but they have highlighted the fact that some of the, the relationship and issues in the first century were issues with boundary markers, right? The, the se separation of Jew and Gentile, and that's true. And so wherever there's false doctrine or, or false teaching, there's always a mixing of some, there's, it's, it's never just straight false. Many times it's mixing. That's how Satan, that's how, that's how you deceive. That's how you have the scheme just to deceive someone. You have to mix truth with error. So it sounds legitimate. And so there is truth here in that Christ has abolished boundary markers. And this would be an example of, of that being the case. Now, the question is, why could we not say this is the moral law? Why would we say this cannot be the moral law? What would be, where could we look for an answer? And why would, um, what would be a reason if I said, you know what, right here, he said he's abolished the flesh of enmity, which is the law of commandments. No more law, tapos na. How could I, how could you respond and say that's a wrong, that's wrong. Anyone want to try to take a crack at it? But how, you, how could you respond to someone claiming he abolished? Go ahead, go ahead, Danny. Uh, I, I think uh, the, uh, the, the ordinances that is referred to is the the circumcision of the Jews and the Gentiles. They are not circumcised. Yeah. So no. You, no so you're correct. It concerns the boundary markers. So circumcision. So this could include circumcision. Physical. I mean, physical yeah, it would circumcision. Include, it would include. Uh, dietary right it would also include um clean unclean so yeah so you're right so my question is what if i said my interpretation is it's all it's all the law how could we respond to that where would we go to prove that that's incorrect that's a hard question you're like oh you know where, where would i go and so we could look at other places in scripture but in paul's mind let's just look at ephesians Let's just look at Ephesians and see if in Paul's mind, he meant that the rest are abolished. Let's quickly go. I did a very quick search today when I was preparing. Does this contradict Jesus' statement? No, Paul maintains the content of the law. So look, the rest of Ephesians contradicts the claim that he was abolishing all of the law. In Ephesians 4.25, you're commanded not to lie. That's part of the law. Ephesians 4.28, he commands them not to, not to steal. That's part of the law. So for him to say that, for, for someone to claim that he's contradicting or abolishing all the law, it's Paul himself would contradict that claim, is what I'm trying to say. Number three, do not murder. And, and specifically, anger or hate is, is mentioned in, in 5.31. Uh, 5, 1, and 2, love others in God. Number five, sexual sin. It includes adultery. Do not have sexual sin. So that's a reference to even within the Decalogue. And then number six, honor your parents. So th those were six specific commands that were commanded in the Old Testament law that are still binding today. So you could not say that Paul was abolishing the law generally and were no longer bound to keep the moral law. And we're, we're literally using Ephesians to, to, this would be exegesis at work, answering a question on the basis of what Paul, uh, context, we're, we're, answering the, the, we're answering that question in context. I hope that you can use this as an example of how to respond. So if someone asks a question, this is my interpretation. One thing you could look at is you could look at the rest of the book to see, would Paul answer that question? Would this writer of the word of God answer the question? Is, that, is everyone tracking there? Let's, let me take a moment to ask a question. Any, any questions or does that make sense? So basically, instead of using the word abolish, we, we safely use the word fulfillment. Well, or fulfill. Well, or... But you can use abolish in this context if you're looking at the Gentile perspective. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. It's, it's the true. Gentile perspective. So... It's not, it's not in the historic redemptive perspective, but it's from a Jew-Gentile Jew perspective. They're just, so if you can just imagine, and I did this illustration once before, you have a person here, there's the wall, and here is, so this is Israel, this is Gentile, right? So when you, so when you, you, you knock down the wall, right, you would say it's abolished. <laughs> but 
But from the perspective of a Jewish perspective, it's been fulfilled. So there's no longer a need for it. So if this was a Jewish audience, he would not have used the word abolish. And so, Sonny, you are correct in saying from a historic redemptive perspective, we should not use the word abolish. But if you're speaking specifically to the Gentile perspective, what, what has been done, you could use it. In a, and, and specifically, again, uh, Sonny, with reference to boundary markers. Yeah. Uh, ah, yeah, 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 boundary markers. It's, yeah. it's new. Cool. Great question, Sonny. And so I hope that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're bringing together these, these, um, uh, uh, these concepts. Okay. Okay. So look here now we're, it's, this is going to get really crazy. So we're going to move pretty quick. I know we're running out of time, but we're going to move pretty quick here. So look at this here. We have, he's broken down these boundary markers for a purpose. This is the purpose. So he's broken them down so that in himself, so this is, remember, this, this is coming away with the head and body, right? So Christ is the head and we are his body, right? So he might make the two into one, the new man, ha, <laughs> the goal, the new man, the new Adam. He's the last Adam. He's making the new man though, okay? We are the body of Christ who is the head. And the conclusion here is thus establishing peace. So number one purpose, so that he might make two into one. And look at this, number two purpose. And he might reconcile them both in one body to God. <laughs> wow, look at that. Come on. So he's reconciling them both in one body to God. Yeah, so let's do this. Peace between mankind. Peace between mankind. And so that's why you have the, the, the ceremonial. Think about it this way. The focus here is in this specific context. So think about in, in Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, the issue is between God and man. There's conflict between God and man. In Ephesians 11 to 22, there's conflict between people in the church. The Jew and Gentiles, even though they're brought together, their sins are dealt with between God, you still have the boundary markers. So the Jews don't want to, they cannot eat with the Gentiles, right? Peter was afraid. And so, so, so he has to deal with those issues so that they can come together, so that they can come together. And so the peace can deal with, with God, but also between man. And if you remove the boundary markers that is creating the division, then they can become one. That's what's happening. Excellent clarification. So fundamentally, again, let's be clear here. The moral law is referring to um, summer, sum, summarizing love God and love neighbor. That's still in effect. That's still binding. Always binding. Sneak peek. So it makes so much more sense that Paul's prayer beginning in Ephesians 4. Take a peek at what the number one issue is in Ephesians 4. Someone take a peek there while I'm talking here. Just think about what that main idea, Ephesians 4, like 1 to 2, 1 to 3. What's the issue in the church? If we're talking about these boundary markers between mankind, between Jew and Gentile, what is the struggle in Ephesians 4? Anyone? Did anyone look that up? Plus 13. Yeah, is go ahead. fasting part of the boundary markers? What is? Fasting. Fasting. I would say specific fasts. But the general practice of fasting, I would say, um, would, still be, would still be commanded. So Jesus commands fasting generally, but, but the specific fast, the specific feasts, those are also boundary markers, yeah. So look at verse three, four verse three, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. <laughs> Woo! So you're seeing how, Paul has to get to the theology before he can command them to be peace. So here, no commands, Diba. We're still just learning what, what to know, what to know, what to know. He has not yet said, 
live at peace with each other, right? That's going to come in Ephesians 4. Right now, he's laying the foundation, pa, and then you're going to get it. The, the unity of the spirit in the body of peace, in the bond of peace. So it's coming, okay? So I, I'm just, I'm, I'm wetting your whistle to, to Paul's structure, okay? So let, let's go back, let's go back here to um, Ephesians 2. We're going to finish. We're, we're getting close here, okay? So um, he might reconcile both in one body. This is the body of Christ through the cross by putting to death the enmity. So looking here in one sense, it's also, this is also fulfillment. I hope you can see that because the cross, the cross was prophesied to happen. So on the cross, Christ fulfilled and put to death the need to have these boundary markers. So again, this is coming back to Sonny's question and emphasizing if we're speaking in a historic redemptive in a theological sense, we should not use abolish. We should use fulfillment. But in, in looking at conflict between people, we can say abolish. So then look here now. And he came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to, to those who are near. So what is this here? Can someone give me what this is? Why is it all caps? If you have a cross-reference Bible, check it out. This is a quotation. This is a quotation from where? Isaiah 57 in verse 19. Isaiah 57 is a time of fulfillment of, of, of the promises of God. Creating the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal, and I will heal them. And so this is bringing together, this is bringing people back in, into the presence. And so here, this is concerning the promise of the Lord for healing. So in time and space, Jesus came and proclaimed peace to the Gentiles and peace to those who are Jews. Is this not fundamental to the gospel? Let me read another passage of scripture. Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Ah, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, just as it has been written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so preached can also be stated, proclaimed good news. You could also say proclaimed good news. So in the cross, Christ proclaimed peace to you who are far away, and peace to you who are near. In the cross, he has brought us in together. Think about this. Let me read one other passage. Let me read one other passage to you. Let's go here to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verses 31. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 12, verse 31. Verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, when I am lifted up on the cross, I will draw all people to myself. How can he bring all people to himself and, and break down the wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile? He abolishes those boundary markers and creates through the cross, because all of us are sinners, the new man. And this was promised from Abraham. The blessedness of the Messiah will go to all people. And why fundamentally why is there peace? Through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Son, Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father. The Trinitarian God is working for our salvation. For through him, we have access in one spirit to the Father. So look at this. You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are. So you're no longer, this is what you're no longer. Now you are fellow citizens with the saints. So who are the saints here? 
Who are the saints? The believers. Okay, Koya Danny, but I want I need more specifics. Who are the saints? Let's be clear here, okay? So the you Those here who is went ahead of us. These are Ephesian saints. These are Ephesian with the say Ephesian believers right here. Those who went ahead of, ahead of us, yes, in the past. So specifically, who are they? Thinking about our relationship here, are these not? Is this not Israel? You will be a holy nation. Saint, saint means holy. Who are the holy ones? This is the the this is this is Israel. This is the the holy nation. Is everyone is everyone tracking there with what's being said? You, Ephesian Gentiles, are fellow citizens with the saints. Is everyone tracking there with what's being said? So Gentiles are now fellow citizens. You're one and the same with the saints. That is the believing Jews. And you are all God's household. So this is, we could say God's, we could say God's house. Dwelling place, right? Going tracking. Having been built. So there's this new house. So think about this, the church. The church is built on a foundation of apostles, prophets, and ultimately Christ. He's... He's the cornerstone. I'll just put him at the bottom. Right? The cornerstone. Does everyone see that? So if this is the church, this is Jew and Gentile. How amazing is that? So this is the, this is the building here. Having been built on the, the apostles and the prophets. And look at this. In whom the whole building is being fit together. So this is literally... This language before of with, I talked to you about that we were with Christ. We were raised with Christ. It's this word that's connected. It's the same word connected here. The same word with is here. And also the same word with is also here. Fellow citizens, this, this close unity being fit together and growing up into a holy temple. Look at the object here, holy temple. From biblical theology, the, the temple is the place of fellowship with God. Remember that? And so now the temple is not physical. It's spiritual. It's the body, Jew and Gentile. So you have, you have, a, you have a house. This is where God dwells, the dwelling of God. This is where we fellowship with God. This is the house of God. It's this. This house is being repeated here. The fellow citizens give the idea of, of one, one nation, or we could say a city. And then here you have, where's the body? Where's the body? Where's the body? Then you have body here. So look at all these images, one body. A holy temple, the dwelling house of God. <laughs> this is what has been done. So there can be no enmity. There can be no division in the body of Christ, in the house of God. We're all the same. Now there's debate here. I, I believe with all my heart that this is a reference to the Old Testament prophets. And this is a reference to New Testament That's my interpretation. It's debated, but I really believe that. That the church is founded on, so we could say Old Testament and New Testament, New Testament writings. I, I really believe that. It just it just fits in the context and it just makes this so beautiful. The climax in history 
in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to the purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, in heaven and on earth. He put all things under his feet and gave him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So this right here, this is not an aside, brothers and sisters. This is, this is climax. All throughout the Old Testament in the Psalms, there's the promise of the nations coming in, the nations being a part of God's people. And now we're seeing that in the church. We're seeing this climax. Jew and Gentile, one body, one holy temple, one holy nation in Christ, the new man, <laughs> the new man. So I hope that we really see here, we're closing on this. I'm, I'm sorry that we've, we've, kept you, we've kept you long. So incredibly powerful. I, I think that the big idea I want us to see here is that God not only works to reconcile us, to himself, but also with our fellow man. That's beautiful. God is working in Christ to seat us in the heavenly places. We have been sat in the heavenly places with him. We have been made alive in Christ for good works. We've been reconciled to God in Christ, and we're also being reconciled to our fellow man in Christ. So think about the application. We have reconciliation, God to man. We have reconciliation, man with man. Very powerful. Very powerful.